You know, just a few years ago, that was my preferred method of communicating. And just a few years ago, there is no way I would be up on stage doing what I'm doing right now. Because you see, in college, my social anxiety was so bad that I was always getting these convenient imaginary phone calls that would allow me to escape the room and avoid making small talk. And in high school, during the marching band fundraiser, where we had to go door to door selling calendars, I was so afraid to go ring these doorbells that I would always generously offer my calendars to my more extroverted friend to sell. That guy still owes me money now that I think about it. And uh, in junior high, I frequently found myself not turning in my homework assignments because I was too afraid to call a classmate to ask what the assignment was. I would literally rather take a bad grade than talk to someone on the phone, a classmate even, for just 30 seconds. I was hopelessly shy, too afraid to look most people in the eye, and by the time I was 21, 22, I'd sort of resigned myself to the fact that I was going to have to spend the rest of my life being afraid of talking to other people, especially those that I didn't know. I didn't want to be this way, of course, and it really tore me up inside. And at that point in my life, more than anything, I just wanted to no longer to have to answer that awful question that I kept hearing over and over, but never really had an answer for. Why are you so quiet? So I began to obsess over this problem with social anxiety that I had. And note that I'm using social anxiety and shyness interchangeably. There are differences. However, if you suffer from one or the other, especially as a kid, it may not necessarily feel that way. So after obsessing over how I could fix this, um, an idea hit me one night. And I knew this idea had the potential to not only help me get over my remaining social insecurities once and forever, but perhaps help me connect better with my own friends and family members, and maybe even help the more than 15 million Americans that I learned also suffer from social anxiety. Unbeknownst to me at the time, this idea would also score me a free burrito one day. And all it involved was a simple blog post and a spreadsheet. You see, in June 2013, in Colorado Springs, I did a social experiment I made up called 90 Strangers in 30 Days, where I forced myself to go out and try and start conversations with at least three people I didn't know every day for the entire month. As I did this, I recorded all of the data, such as the person's demographic, where and how I started the conversation, and what we talked about, and I put it all in a spreadsheet. Typically, I started these conversations in places like the mall, networking events, the grocery store, typically anywhere where I would have a quick escape route if things started to get overly awkward and weird. But except for just one occasion, things never did. And when all was said and done, I had ended up talking to 118 different people that month. So I'm a writer by trade, and I thought it would be a fun way to wrap up this project by writing a blog post about my five biggest takeaways. And the first of those, as cliche as it sounds, simply the importance in pursuing my passions. I found that if I was out doing things that I was interested in already, it was so much easier to start a conversation with someone I didn't know because I knew we likely had at least one thing in common already. The next thing was that my fear that I would be bothering people by trying to talk to them in public wasn't really a valid one, and I found that people in general were so much nicer than I was giving them credit for. And because I know you're probably wondering, the only instance where someone was even remotely cold to me was a woman at Target that was buying a cool-looking journal. Again, being a writer, I wanted to ask her about it, so I walked up to her and said, hey, are you a writer? To which she replied, <laughs> but it was a great lesson in empathy, and I learned right then that no one is under any obligation to talk to me when I do this kind of thing. The next thing was the power in not hesitating when starting these interactions. I found the trick was that I had to act so fast that my mind didn't have time to tell my body all the reasons that it really shouldn't be doing this. The next thing wasn't anything I learned through the experiment, but instead through my existing friends. There were a few of them that I kind of looked up to as sort of social role models that I told about the experiment. And they confided back in me that even they too wish they were more social with people they didn't know. This desire was a lot more widespread than I initially thought. And the fifth and final thing was ultimately the most important one. And that is simply the importance and power in looking for opportunities to meet with and chat with new people everywhere. 
By not making anyone off limits during my experiment, I had a two hour conversation with a complete stranger at a bar about life, universe, and everything in between. I found out about a series of acoustic concerts in the city that I probably wouldn't have otherwise. And while this didn't happen during the original experiment, I even met my girlfriend this way. Hey, babe. <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> so then, sort of as an afterthought, I decided to take this post that was originally just for me and put it up on Reddit. For those of you that don't know, Reddit is the so-called front page of the internet where you can submit, view, and comment on pictures, videos, news stories, and anything else related to any niche interest you could possibly have. So I put my post on a board that has about 140,000 readers called Our Social Skills, and where people go and ask for and offer advice in regards to developing better social skills. So I did this on a random weekday morning, and between you and me, I didn't get a lot of work done that day. Expecting little, if any, attention at all, I spent the rest of that day in just stunned disbelief, jamming the refresh button on my browser, because my little project had somehow made it on the front page of the entire site and received over 100 comments from people telling me how inspired they were by my project, that they could relate to my message, and that they even planned to do their own versions of my little experiment. Even over three years later, I still receive messages and emails from people telling me how important 90 Strangers was to them, some going as far to say that it changed their life, others asking me for my advice on how they can improve their own social skills. It eventually struck me much later that somehow, me, of all people, the kid that ran out of minutes on his imaginary phone plan, had become a shyness coach, and I've even been interviewed a couple times about the project. But trying to teach myself to become more social felt just impossible at first. Like I was trying to change the tires on a moving car or something. But 90 Strangers gave me these small, actionable steps that eventually led me to that big change that I wanted more than anything. To be able to go into a room where I didn't know anyone, and instead of feeling the urge to turn and run right out of my skin, to actually enjoy my time there, chatting with and meeting new people. Because imagine, if you will, that you were told over and over, throughout your childhood and into adulthood, how important having a particular set of skills was to your success and happiness in life, yet given no instruction on how to actually obtain these skills. You'd probably feel frustrated, helpless, maybe even a little resentful toward a world that keeps presenting you with a door that seemingly everyone except you has the key for. Sadly, this is basically what we do as a society in regards to social skills. Now, like I alluded to before, social anxiety affects an estimated 15 million Americans according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Of that 15 million, 36% report experiencing symptoms for 10 or more years before seeking help, typically beginning at around age 13. Age 13. Now, I know what you might be thinking, and yeah, sure. A lot of kids have a sort of socially clumsy or awkward phase growing up, and it's somewhat seen as a normal part of childhood. And while many kids do outgrow this, many, many others don't. And quickly, as they get older, they're no longer just seen as normally weird, but instead they are relabeled as outcasts and as flawed, both of which are basically invitations to be bullied in what's a terribly self-reinforcing circle. This, of course, isn't contained to just grade school, but can go on to evolve into other forms of abusive behavior in college, the corporate office, and just about everywhere else in our society. The kicker is, though, that few, if any, would disagree that social skills are one of the very most important things to develop in life. You know, with a few exceptions, there's something we don't teach deliberately and directly. For some reason, with this particular skill set, we, cho we choose to stigmatize, and ins instead of help, those that are a little bit behind. But if you're terrible at math or reading or another subject as a kid, chances are you at least have the opportunity at your school or in your community to work with a tutor or find a study group that will help you in those areas. But if you start to reach high school age and are still taking imaginary phone calls, usually the most help you'll receive is a proverbial, silent, and always helpful, ah, gee, best of luck, hope you figure it out. Telling someone to just be confident or just be yourself, man, that's empty advice to someone that's never known what either of those things means. It's akin to telling an athlete that wants to increase their vertical to, come on, John, you know, just jump higher. More ridiculous, perhaps, is not that social skills aren't taught, but is that they can be taught easily and at minimal cost, as I learned through my experiment. 
Now, while going out and talking to random people in the stationary aisle at Target at 9 o'clock at night might have limited real-world utility, if you can muster up the courage to just say, hey, how are you, to 90 people or more in a single month, I can just about guarantee that next networking event or that next party is going to be a lot less scary and probably a lot more fun. Moreover, this idea is infinitely scalable. For someone that's an even harder case than I was, they could simply do something like 30 strangers in 30 days, or while it's not as catchy, something like make good eye contact with 30 people in 30 days, and then build from there. So over the course of the years, as my social skills have simply just improved, not necessarily became perfect, whatever that might mean to you, I still have my fair share of awkward interactions, my overall quality of life has improved dramatically as well. I've become a much happier and more motivated person. Career opportunities have opened themselves up to me that I know wouldn't have otherwise. And, well, I don't like to brag, yeah, I even once got a free burrito at Chipotle just by small talking with the guy behind the counter. <laughs> Truly opportunities everyone deserves to have. But while all these things made me happy to a degree, I also couldn't help but feel a little curious about my past. And I couldn't help but wonder about what kind of opportunities I'd missed out on because I wasn't naturally socially gifted. A big part of me just kind of wondered what kind of difference would it have made if someone at any point, say a teacher, had noticed that I was having trouble socializing and just sat me down and said, Andrew, I know it can be confusing on what to talk about with someone you don't know, but a conversation for the most part is just trading questions and anecdotes back and forth. Or that, hey, if you're ever talking to someone you find intimidating, just stand in a big, strong, confident power pose with good body language and the situation won't seem as scary, I promise. Now, 90 Strangers is, of course, just one way to teach, practice, and implement these skills. And there are many other great programs out there with similar missions. For instance, a 2004 study tested the effectiveness of a social skills intervention program with third graders that were having a hard time at school, being liked by their peers, and being bullied. After just one week in this program, for 10 weeks, Every single child showed an increase in their self-esteem and how they were treated by their classmates and a decrease in their social anxiety compared to the control group. So programs like this, like 90 Strangers, as simple of an idea as that may be, and countless others have been proven to be effective, and now just time to make them available to those that need them the most. I believe that social skills are just that, a skill set. And I hope this idea can communicate to parents, teachers, and kids themselves that you or your child didn't get dealt a bad hand. This is something that can be learned and that can be changed, and it doesn't need to be complicated. These types of programs could be tweaked and plugged into existing classroom curriculum already, or maybe it's the kind of game you play with your teenagers out on the weekend. Challenge them to go ask a cashier how their day is going, maybe giving them some sort of reward if they do that X amount of times throughout the weekend as sort of an intro to small talk. I should add here that cashiers are perfect fodder for anyone looking to improve their social skills because they're basically being paid to be nice to you. That's great. <laughs> None of this requires an app or any technology beyond pen and paper, perhaps just a mentor with the courage and self-awareness to explain that, yeah, all right. A lot of making small talk can feel just downright agonizingly pointless at first, and even the most social people don't necessarily like it. Yet while it might feel fake, this is the pathway through which genuine connections and eventually friendships are formed, especially when you're an adult. And as we seemingly become social with more people in less social ways today, it's easy to forget the enjoyment of genuine connection that can only come through the art of a face-to-face -face conversation. So instead of leaving this art to those that are lucky enough to develop these skills on their own, I hope we can all think about ways in which, in which we can help cultivate them in those that need a little help pull them out of the shadows, and as a result, create a more social world. Because when we teach social skills, what we're really teaching is confidence. And that's a key to life that everybody deserves the opportunity to have. Thank you.